family thank you for joining us today hey we have a lot of things that are going on here at christ community and with the summer coming to an end we would love for you to find a place to um just get connected maybe you want to join a different group or um, join a group for the first time but you can head over to our website at cccgreeley.org and you can find all the things that are happening here um and we hope you enjoy the message today um, it's good to see you. Happy Saturday, everyone. Um, I am, I'm so excited to be here because there's a couple of things that are going to be happening and talked about. Uh, first of all, our church is doing a sermon series on the book of Psalms and taking a handful of Psalms and exploring them and um, exploring our own hearts and the heart of God and the heart of David. Uh, second of all, uh, today... Um, you all are going to have the opportunity to participate in the Lord's Supper, also known as communion. And communion is one of my favorite sacraments. And so um, the the honor to be up here to, to be able to hold the bread and to hold the cup and to offer them, it's an honor. Um, communion um, is a verb. It's not a noun. Um, and so, so if, if you kind of just shift what that is uh, from being a thing into a participatory action, it shifts a lot. It's a verb. It's, it's something you're doing. You are communing. Um, communion, it's not a noun. It's a verb. And so but then you got to ask, who am I communing with? with and what does it mean um so am i communing as far as god and i am i communing together with the other people here in the church are we doing both yes you get the opportunity to commune with god and each other um, and to uphold the sacrament of the bread and the blood and what a sacrament is is a it's a physical example of a spiritual truth. Um, and so that's kind of fun, right? It's a, 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 a physical example of a spiritual truth. So the, the blood and the, the, the body are some symbolized in bread and juice or wine. And so the ability to tell the story of the gospel of Jesus Christ or to embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ or to participate in the gospel of Jesus Christ or because you've forgotten uh, the, the ability to be reminded of the gospel of Jesus Christ through a sacrament, a symbol, and to do it together uh, as a church and then between God and you and the Holy Spirit and everyone it is an incredible opportunity. And as they say, the gospel of Jesus Christ, it seems very simple. It's this idea that God saw us separated from him, and he is a God of action. Um, God is a God of pursuit. God is a God who, if he sees things that are not okay, he's coming after it. He's going to fix it. He is a fixer. Um, he cares. God cares. And so in this idea of separation. God was born 100% human, 100% God here on the earth, and he was here for 30 years, or 33 years, and he was perfect, absolutely perfect, a perfect sacrifice. He died on the cross. His blood was spilt so that our sins, our, the, the, the sin debt could be paid, and then he died. He was in the grave for three days. He was really dead. He was dead dead, dead. And then after three days, he came back to life. He conquered the grave. He says, D death is not the end. This is not over. Death doesn't have the final say. I do. I win. Um, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wins. Um, and this idea of the cup and the bread says he wins right? Um, there's this vocabulary of the presence of God, this, the, this sacrament, the, the body and the blood. It says he is here. He's behind us. He's ahead of us. He's our foundation. He's our fortress. He, he is beside us. He is our king. He is our general. He is our friend. He is our father. He is our shepherd. He is. And 
I get the honor of talking about Psalm 18. And if there ever is a psalm that would embody communion in the presence of God, it is Psalm 18. If someone composed a song that said, I'm going to sing a song about communion, it would be Psalm 18. In fact, some passages in the Bible, they aren't intended just to be uh, be picked apart by ourselves or to, to be experienced silently. That there are some parts in the Bible that are specifically set apart to be spoken and verbalized. Some parts of the Bible are supposed to be verbalized in groups of people. That was their intention. And some parts of the Bible are composed to be sung. And Psalm 18 was specifically composed to be sung. That was the point. It isn't supposed to be experienced in silence or solitude or as a singular person. This psalm is supposed to be sung by a chorus of people. It's supposed to be sung by the Hebrew people. It is the battle hymn of the Republic as they're going into battle. It's like that type of song. And it's all about the presence of God. The presence of God as the the foundation the fortress, him being behind us, him being ahead of us, and him being by our side. As if King David believed that if his kingdom could sing this song, nothing could ever stand against them because God always wins. Okay, Psalm 18. So here's the beginning of Psalm 18. Here it is. It starts out by saying, I love you, Lord. But remember, this is a song. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I will take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. All right. So this is how Psalm 18 begins. The Lord is my rock. Rock, my fortress, my horn of salvation, my refuge. Picture this. First of all, this is battle vocabulary. A horn of salvation is a horn that is blown during a time that people have to have help. That the other armies here and come charging in. And David is saying, you are my horn of salvation. I blow it and every, you come rushing in. And then he says, you are my rock. I can stand on you. You're my fortress. You are, you're not even my foundation. You are the thing that is built on it. You build my, you are the shelter. You are the thing the shelter is built on and you are the horn I can blow if I need you. Wow, I love you. Can you picture an army singing this song? right? It's, it's, it's our God is the foundation, the fortress, and the horn, and we're in love. God wins, right? There's this picture of safety and solitude. There's a lot happening here. If I am, am teaching this to a child, I have a lot of content. Man, hey guys, build your life on Jesus. He's the rock. God, guys, build your, your house in him. He's the fortress. And everything that happens inside, he's that too. Jesus is everything. And he loves you. That's the whole gospel. It's over. Done. We love Jesus. I, I remember the first time that I felt so safe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I grew up Catholic. And I loved growing up in the Catholic church. It felt so safe. At the age of 12, I attended catechism. And in catechism, I was taught all the facts of the faith and theology. And at the end of catechism, you have your first communion. And I remember first communion, and I had the tithe that had the the, the tiny little clip on the back and I had my first suit. I was 12 and I was adorable. And I was so excited because I was gonna join a secret club. It's the 
the club of, I get it. And I'm going to be a part of God's family. And I get the priest. He's going to talk to me. Ugh. I remember this, like the depth and the feeling and excitement. And there was all these 12 year olds all in a, 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 and the priest held the bread and he, in him, through him, by the Holy Spirit, you know, he consecrates it. And then he takes the cup and he holds it. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's happening. It's my time. And then all of us, one by one, we stand before this priest and he says, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. This is the, the blood of Christ spilt for you. Take and drink. And then he would bend down and hug each boy and he would say something. And so so I was going up and I'm just like so excited. My heart's pounding. I am finally going to participate in the sacrament of the church. I had my tie. I was awesome. And we're going up and this priest looked huge to me in his garment and the, the thing, you know? And, and I'm like standing, like I am looking up at him and he's holding the, the elements. And I just like, I could not contain my heart. And he says, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. And I did. And then he said, this is the, the blood of Christ spilt for you. Take and drink. And I did. And he bent down and said, may he be your rock and your fortress for all time. And then he hugged me. And I thought, I made it. I'm in, like I have been blessed in the protection of God, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ. Yes. That's the end of the st 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 story. I love that moment. I participated in something really, really, really special. There was this idea that from this point on and probably before that point, God has got me. And there's the gospel of Jesus Christ always wins. It always wins. And in this moment, I got to participate in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. There's something so grounded in this first part of Psalm 18 of seeing him as your rock, your fortress, and the horn of salvation, especially for a people group. Think about who these Hebrew people are. They are trying to find their identity. They're trying to find their protection. They're trying to ask the question, who am I? And David is beginning by pointing simply, here's the song you sing. In the times that, the, that things are chaotic, in the times that things are hard, in the times that you can't tell up from down, here's the song you sing. This is meant to be a song and you're not meant to sing it by yourself. This is meant to be sung as a people group, as a congregation, and as a country. Can you imagine what it would be if a country sang this song, I love you, Lord? All right, so the psalm continues on from here. The cords of death entangle me. Love it. The torrents of destruction overwhelm me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I called to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. And my cry came before him into his ears. The song continues here. Like he paints this picture. I am safe in God. He is my foundation. He is my fortress. If you attack it, you will lose. He is my horn of salvation. He comes charging in. And then he changes his tune a bit and says, the cords of death are entangling me. Um, this, he, he paints this picture of chaos, hardship, and death and darkness. Because King David is a human being with a human heart, feeling human things. And he has a story that is happening that it feels like everything is falling apart. 
And in this time that everything is falling apart, he's saying the cords of death entangle me. The poetry of that is brilliant. I love him. The cords of death entangle me and I called out to you and you heard my cry. My cries reached your ears in the temple. There's something about our voice can be heard by God, of course. But how cool is it that our voice can be heard by God? David is celebrating the fact and calling it out. God hears our voice. When I cry out, you hear me. You hear me in the temple. Wow. You saw me. You hear me in times of darkness, despair, and death. You are there. How many of us experience times of hardship, experience times of chaos, experience times of death, experience times of cancer, experience times of separation, experience times of being fired, experience times of whatever it is, and we are crying out to God, and sure enough, he hears us. That is a song of celebration. Our God is a God of action. Our God is a God who hears. Our God is a God who is actively pursuing us. He is a fixer. He is a seer. He is not okay in times of death and tragedy. He will hunt death down because he always wins. Always. There was this time in college I was really, really going through a hard time. I was going to college to get a degree in theology because I loved the Old Testament. Um, Surprise. Uh, And I wanted to teach the Old Testament more than anything. And I wanted to get a degree in theology and, and preach from the Old Testament. And the head of the Bible department pulled me aside and said, Hey, Jay, there's a couple of things. First of all, you can't just preach the Old Testament. People aren't going to hire you to do that. Then he said, second of all, I'm just going to be honest. You can't talk. People aren't going to hire you to do a sermon. So he encouraged me to get a degree in fine art so I could paint the gospel and show people the gospel through fine art. This guy, he was an incredible man. I, he's a hero. He's a hero of the faith. And to hear someone who is a hero of the faith, who I look up to, to tell me that the desires of my heart and the thing that I actually felt like I was built to do isn't good enough for anyone or the path that I feel called on. So I did the thing that I typically do in times of chaos. I go to Burger King. I love Burger King. I love Burger King so much. Um, there's a, it's just, I can talk about Burger King all day, so I, t- 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 I won't. Um, but I'm that guy, right? I love Burger King. And so I'm sitting at B- B- Burger King, and there's this old couple sitting in a booth across the Burger King thing. And so, so I'm going to college. On It's by the app. Appalachian Trail in Tennessee. It's so close to the Appalachian Trail that I call it the Appalachian Trail. I don't call it, I don't even know how to say it, how it's supposed to say it. It's the Appalachian Trail. Our Burger King, it was on the Appalachian. And so this old couple is very Appalachian, okay? They are, are, are old Appalachian and, and uh, I can't even describe it. The, the John D- D- Deere hat, half his teeth, a f- f- flannel shirt. And, and then she had this dress that goes down over her and the bun. And they were great. And so they're opening their Bibles up and they're talking about Jesus. And at this point, I'm eating Burger King thinking, I'm done. I was told to paint the gospel, and I'm a really bad painter. And I hear these people talk about Jesus. 
And I'm just like, that's what I want. I want to talk about Jesus at Burger King. And so I just go over there and I, I, I feel defeated. And I said, hey, can, the, can all of us just talk about Jesus together? Like, who is he? Who is he? Show me something I don't know about him. And I just, just start bawling. And man, the two of them, <laughs> their eyes got so big, like, finally, I've heard of this time to share the gospel of Jesus. Like, it was like their time has come. And so, so, so I sit in their b- b- booth, and they, in a very simple, in a very simple, simple way, they share the gospel of Jesus. Uh, again, as if I haven't ever heard it before. And I have it in a Burger King booth. And it felt like that was the holiest place that I could have possibly been in, was Burger King. And having these two people with this crazy accent that I could barely understand and they could barely understand me and it was beautiful. And then the guy got this idea and he got really excited and he got up, he went to the Burger King counter and I heard him say, just the bun, just the bun. No, just the bun. And they gave him a bun and he came back and he had soda and a bun. And he said, this is supposed to be juice and this is supposed to be be bread, but it's just the bun and the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. And, and he and I and his wife, shared communion in Burger King. And in that time, I felt like, man, God has my back. God knew I needed communion at Burger King in the form of a soda and a hamburger bun with sesame seeds on it because this is who I am. If I'm ever to do a sermon of value that's like from my heart, it's in the form of a poppy seed, like sesame seed bun and a soda saying body of Christ, blood of Christ. I can't do it like everybody else. God is behind us. Wherever you are, he is behind us. And his body and his blood, they surround us. It is our foundation. It is our fortress. It is our horn of salvation. This psalm doesn't end here. It continues on and it gets better. Here it is. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. All right. So he... He is my foundation. He is my fortress. He is my horn of salvation. The cords of death surround me and they entangle me. And he heard my cry from the temple. God hears me. And then he reached down and came alongside me. He reached down and began to be active inside of me. He reached down and engaged what was happening. He was here. Think about the Jewish people and think about all the other people who serve all the other gods that are out there. The ability to sing a song about how active your God is, how participatory your God is, how God is like, he is an action God. He just doesn't see us and hope for the best. He says, I'm getting my hands dirty down there. I hear the cries of my people. I am going to fix this. I am going to save this. I am going to heal this. I am going to give direction. I do things. This is a song that no other people could sing. And David knew that, that the God of the Hebrew people was a distinct God of action. All the other gods don't care. Ours does, and it will beat you. 
He will beat you. He always wins. And in this song is this, this song of presence. He is our foundation. He is our fortress. He is our horn of salvation. He is behind us. And then here, he is beside us. He heard us and he is coming down by our side. He is going to fight this battle. And if I am going into battle and I am an army and I am singing this song, this is a true song of God is with us. God will fight this. And all throughout the, the Hebrew Bible, it shows that, right? Like how God goes ahead of the Hebrew people and cities fall before they even get there. God is a God of pursuit, action. Love it. There was this time um, in 2010 that my mom got a brain tumor. And she was going to die very quickly. And she had been my best friend. She is my best friend. Probably isn't healthy. Um, my mom was my best friend. I love her. Um, she, she, was a, she could tell s s stories and poetry. She had the book of Proverbs memorized word for word for word, and she'd pray it over us. She was awesome. She got a brain tumor, and she died really fast. Something that I don't ever want to do again is to officiate a funeral for, for someone in my own family. And I did that because I thought I should. And so I was there in front of my whole family and then her friends, and it felt like half our city, telling them how incredible my mom is. And I pointed out to them, I said, you all know that she was a force for the kingdom. And they all started applauding because they knew it. Oh, if I have an enemy, it is cancer, it's death itself. If there are times of chaos and like, oh, that I call out, it was during this time that I was begging God to show up. So my family, that they wanted at the end of the service for there to be the bread and the cup. And so I had the opportunity to hold the bread up and say, this is the body of Christ that was broken for us in times of death and separation and chaos and agony. Take and eat it. And then I took the cup. I said, this was the, the blood of Jesus that was spilled for us so that all of us could be forgiven so that death doesn't have the final say. Death doesn't, is not the end. Jesus wins here. And then people began to come up. At that time, a friend of mine um, came through the back door. I'm from Ohio. And the funeral was there in Ohio. And someone from here had driven out there. And he came in the back door. And he came, came in and he took the bread and he took the cup and he handed it back to me. I love Jesus. Because in that moment, I felt like he saw me. He saw me there at my mom's f f funeral. He was right beside me. He and I were sitting on a bench t t together, holding the bread, holding the cup. He saw me at Burger King in the soda and the sesame seed bun. He saw me with a Catholic priest in his robes and his garment. There is something to be said about a God who isn't just the foundation for us to build on, but he's the thing you actually build on the thing you're building on. And then he is the song that you sing inside the house that he is. And then to know he was there behind you and to know he was there beside you, but 
That's not the end of the psalm because there's something about the psalm that says, and he's ahead of us, and he's paving paths for us going forward. So here it is. You, Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. With your help, I can advance against a troop. With my God, I can scale a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He causes me to stand on the heights. He trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. You make your saving help my shield. Your right hand sustains me. Your help has made me great. You provide a broad path for my feet so that my ankles don't give way. I can do anything. That's what is happening. He is saying, I can do anything. I can, I can bend a bow of bronze. I can climb walls. Your salvation is my shield. With you at my back and with you ahead of me, you turn darkness into light. What a song to sing. What a song. I love you, Lord. You are my rock, my fortress, your horn of salvation. You are my, you know, like all of it. Then the cords of death but you are there bending down, getting your hands dirty in my life. You are here saving me. And because you are by my side, you are paving paths, turning the darkness into light everywhere you go. David has this thing about how God is the expert of turning darkness into light. To light. It's in almost all of his psalms. God, you light up my path. God, you turn dark things light. There's no dark place I can go that you don't light up. There's this, this whole idea and concept that, that God turns death into life. That is what he is really, really good at. He brings dead things back to life. How many of us have hearts that are dead, that are desperately needed, needing to come back to life? How many of us are calling out to him saying, do you see me? And he's saying, yes, I do. Do you see me? How many of us need a foundation, a fortress, a horn of salvation? a promise of hope, a sesame seed hamburger bun, a soda. How many of us have to have someone to come through the back door during a funeral saying he's here too? How many of us need a song of hope that says he is there turning your dark path into light? The things ahead of you, you have a bright future. <laughs> you have a bright future. If you follow in the path that he has set for you, he is lighting it up. What you thought was bleak and empty and without hope, think about going to battle and troops singing the song going to battle. This is not darkness. This is pure light. Your future in him is pure light. What would it be like to be able to sit in the truth of, man, if God is my fortress and he is the foundation my fortress is built on and he is the song I sing inside the fortress and then every time I call out, he hears me. And when he hears me, he bends down and is active inside of the, the chaos that I am engaging because death happens Bad things happen. We are human beings. Struggles happen. If they didn't, you wouldn't need a 
fortress. You wouldn't have to have a horn of salvation. You wouldn't probably ever have to have help. Bad things happen. Darkness happens. But the gospel of Jesus Christ <laughs> makes darkness untrue. And there's something really beautiful about that. Because the confidence and the courage that David and his armies had when they sang this song, or you think about the people who sang the songs in sacred ceremonies of, I love you, Lord, you're my rock and my fortress and my salvation. Man, you know that they are on a brilliant path of confidence. You know. I had the honor of, uh, there was this couple that, that they proved, <laughs> they proved that, that, that like God ordains people to be together. Um, she was brilliant. He was brilliant. His heart was for her and she was for him. And, and they made, man, like they sparkled. Right, they sparkled. It was every poem combined in a certain, like their story must be told to people. Like they found the thing everyone is trying to find. I was so honored to do their ceremony for them because it was like, I get to participate in some holy thing here. And I was excited to build this incredible ceremony of like, you found love, like real love. Like you guys are going to crush it together. And you're going to inspire the world that God is real. At the end of the service, after I pronounce them husband and wife, before they even kissed, I know, they wanted to share communion. And they didn't want to just share communion together. They wanted to share communion as testimony. And they gave their testimony. And so I, I took the bread and I broke it. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. And they took it. And then this is the cup. This is the blood of Christ built for you as foundation, as fortress, as horn of salvation, as behind, beside, in front of. And they took it. And then they gave their testimony and they said, I want to, as a couple, for us to always be breaking the bread and sharing the cup. And our first act is to share this here with our friends and family because God is. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is. To be able to pray a blessing over a couple from the beginning of their story who says, our story is built upon this. And he has paved a path for us. We aren't afraid. We walk in blessing. The, the path is lit up for us. That was brilliant. To take a couple that is full of hope, inspiration, and they are not afraid. And people applauded as they kissed for the first time. And it felt like the kingdom of heaven just shimmered. Just, oh, so good. From that, as the officiant, to be able to break bread for them, to be able to have someone break bread for me, to have bread broken in the form of a hamburger bun, to have a Catholic priest bless it and crack it and tell me, may God be your fortress and your rock. These are essences of the sacrament of communion. This idea of Psalm 18 that says God is our, our foundation, our fortress. He is behind us. He's beside us. And he is lighting our path going forward. But David just doesn't end in practical theology. He wants to tie it up in a really beautiful, beautiful bow. Here it is. He is God. He is the God who avenges me, who subdues nations under me, who saves me from my enemies. You exalted me above my foes. From a violent man, you rescued me. 
Therefore, I will praise you, Lord, among nations. I will sing the praises of your name. He gives his king great victories. He shows unfailing love to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. So he goes through this whole thing of like, man, God is my foundation, my fortress, my song. He is my salvation. The cords of death entangled me. A sesame seed bun was given to me, presence. And then he bent down and he saw me. There was a guy coming from our church and he offered me communion at my mom's funeral. And then, and, and, and then he puts the path before me. You, you light up the darkness in times of chaos. And when I don't know what direction to go, you lit it up. And you are always fighting for me. You have paved this path. You wrap up my story and you say you will always be there. And because of that, I will sing this song. And all of my descendants after me will sing this song because this is a song that proclaims over and over that God is our rock, our house, our horn of salvation. You're behind us. You are beside us. You are in front of us. You are, you are, you win. You win all the time. That's what this psalm is. And if there ever was a psalm that embodied the sacrament of the body and the blood, it would be Psalm 18. When you come up, when you pick up the bread, when you pick up the cup, when you eat the bread, when you drink the cup, this is a verb. You are communing. Where, when, who, what are you communing with? What's the story of communion for you? Where, <laughs> where, what, when, how, what, when, what, song, who shared it, what does it mean? And then how big of a story for two centuries has the broken body and the spilt blood of Jesus Christ proclaimed the gospel, the simple, profound gospel that God is here and God always wins to those who are going through really tough, chaotic, hard times. As if we need a song to sing that it's impossible for us to forget the presence of God and that he always wins. Lord, thank you for the book of Psalms. Thank you for the heart of King David. Thank you Thank you that he gives us a fun vocabulary to see you and experience you in. Thank you for the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, the things that sing your love. Thank you. Thank you for being our foundation. Thank you for being our fortress. Thank you for being our horn of salvation. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you for saving us. Um, thank you for, for bending down and getting your hands dirty in the things that are because death is real. Our pain is real. Our hardships are real. Um, thank you for seeing that. God, we, we thank you for turning the darkness into light, uh, for, for turning everything clear and bright, um, that evil cannot exist in your presence, that you pave paths for us, um, that you cause blind people to see, that you cause crippled people to stand up and dance, um, that you heal people who are unhealable, and that you save people that are dead. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you in, for your broken body. Um, thank you that you, that you are a healer of not only the body, but also the soul. Uh, thank you for the spilled blood and that you have conquered sin and death and you have a vengeance, a bone to pick against the gates of hell. 
uh, thank you that you have a bone to pick against the gates of hell and that, that all the things that come from there um, that seek to hurt us, uh, that they can't. God, we thank you. All right, so thank you for, for hanging in there until the end. Um, so today's sermon had all been about encouragement and God's presence and, and how he protects us and fights for us. And, and he is here hand in hand until the end. Um, so if you are in a place that you possibly have felt separated from God, you have not felt his presence, if you're in a place that that would be beneficial for someone to encourage you, if, if you are in a place that you just want to share the things that God is doing or isn't doing, um, there are, are people that are excited to talk to you. Um, go to cccgreeley.org. There's a chat button. Someone is on the other side of that who is excited to hear about the things um, that are happening. So please do that. And thank you for being here.